February 10th, 2014 meeting of Verona Common Council to order and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Greetings to everybody. We have a roll call by Ms. Schofield. Alderperson Bear. Here. Alderperson Diaz. Here. Alderperson Doyle. Here. Alderperson Manley. Here. Alderperson Riki. Here. Alderperson Steiner. Here. And Alderperson Years. Here. Item 5, approval of minutes from January 27, 2014. Move approval. Thank you, Mr. Manley. Second. Mr. Yours on the second. Thank you. Is there any discussion, any changes to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes unanimously. Uh, Mayor's business. I do not have any mayor's business. The mayor's not here tonight. Uh, I'm just sitting in for him. So thank you. Under the administrator's report, we'll go to Mr. Burns. Yes, a couple updates this evening. Uh, first, the city has been working on its downtown study and, and plan development for the last year. Uh, that item went to the plan commission for discussion on February 3rd. Uh, there was a lot of discussion um, and comment at that meeting, and the plan commission had decided to hold over discussion for that. So that will be placed on the March 3rd uh, agenda for additional discussion and a possible recommendation from the plan commission. And then the plan is that that would go to the city council following a recommendation uh, by the plan commission, so potentially for the March 10th meeting of the common council. Uh, city staff uh, met with representatives from our insurance carrier, Cities and Villages Mutual Insurance Company, for our annual work plan meeting on February 5th. And as part of that meeting, uh, CIVMIC did a presentation on our loss history, uh, services that they provide, uh, the results of a risk assessment that the city uh, conducted with CIVMIC, and started to lay out recommendations for uh, training and development programs for the year. And we'll be working with staff to schedule those items. And then finally, I wanted to report that there are currently three city positions uh, where we're accepting applications. Uh, that is for two positions in the finance department, uh, the accounting assistant and the newly created accountant position. Applications for those two positions are due on February 14th. And applications for a police officer um, have been posted and I believe applications are due the end of March for that position. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Does anyone have questions for Mr. Burns? Seeing none, we'll move on uh, to the engineer's report. And if it's all right with the uh, council, uh, I think Bill wants me to stay. Bob, oh. <laughs> oh. okay, I guess you're going to stay. Yeah. Very good. Well, the engineer's report would be excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, two items this evening. The first is the scenic ridge uh, phase five lift station. Uh, that was tested last week. Uh, punch lifts list of items that need to be corrected has been um, prepared. Um, the punch lift list items are to be corrected by February 18th and the lift station placed in the service at that time. And the final item is the Lincoln Street reconstruction. Uh, AECOM is completing the plans and specifications for the reconstruction of Lincoln Street from William Street south to the Lincoln Street cul-de-sac, far south end of Lincoln Street. Uh, the work will also include reconstruction of Oak Court and a portion of Holiday Court and complete water main replacement throughout the project limits. Uh, the project will be let for bids in uh, March with construction commencing in April. A late August completion date is anticipated at this time. Uh, that completes my report for this evening. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Bob. Welcome. We'll move on to uh, nine uh, <coughs> committee reports. And Ms. Doyle, if you could take finance committee, that'd be great. 
Thank you, Mr. McGilvery. Um, item 9A1, I would like to make a motion for the payment of the bills in the amount of $1,026,899.07. We have a motion. Thank you, Mr. Manley. Ms. Dora. Thank you. Um, I would like to note one expense for a debt service payment in the amount of $420,684.38. Thank you. Any further explanation of the monthly bills? Uh, one of the larger items, are there any further questions for finance? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of paying the monthly bills in the amount of, again, if you could. Certainly. I didn't get it written down. That is one million twenty six thousand eight hundred ninety nine dollars and seven cents. Thank you. All those in favor of paying the monthly bills signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion passes. Thank you. Uh, item we'll move on to uh, item nine B, Public Safety and Welfare Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Under item 9B1, I would like a, to make a motion to deny an operator's license for Timothy Knox because based on the following factors, Mr. Knox failed to satisfy the qualifications for, an, for a license. Number one, Mr. Knox failed to disclose several violations which he had been convicted of as required by the operator's license application. Number two, Mr. Knox is a habitual law offender under section 125.04 of the Wisconsin statutes. And number three, Mr. Knox's multiple convictions for operating while intoxicated, intoxicated and his theft conviction are substantially related to his ability to serve fermented malt beverages and or intoxicating liquors. Thank you, Mr. Manley, for that thorough explanation. I would need a second. Thank you, Mr. Yours. Are there any further questions or discussion concerning the motion? Second, Mr. Manley? I, I, <clears throat> I'd just like to, to note for the record that um, the applicant had requested a hearing um, based on the, the denial that he had received and the applicant was notified in writing on January 31st, uh, basically two weeks ago, that his hearing was to be held this evening and the applicant uh, did not show up for that hearing. Thank you, Mr. Manley. Any further discussion? You've heard the motion and the second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion passes. Anything else uh, for the good of the council, Mr. Manley? Nothing further. Thank you. We'll move on to the personnel committee. Thank you, Mr. McGilvery. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Doyle. For item 9C1, discussion and possible action regarding employment agreement for the senior center director position, the Common Council may convene in closed session as authorized by section 19.851C of the Wisconsin statutes for the purpose of considering employment and compensation of a public employee over which the Common Council has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. The Common Council may reconvene in open session and may take action on the closed session item. And because um, we haven't publicly said who the candidate is at this time, I would like to make a motion for those reasons to go into closed session. Thank you. The second would be in order. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, we'll take a vote. Roll call vote, I believe, Ms. Gofield. Alderperson Bayer? Aye. Alderperson Diaz? Aye. Alderperson Doyle? Aye. Alderperson Manley? Aye. Alderperson Rieke? Aye. Alderperson Steiner? Aye. And Alderperson Yours? Aye. Thank you. Um, we will be going into closed session. It should be a relatively quick closed session, I would imagine, so please stay and we'll come right back in.
right, thank you. We are back in open session. We've had our discussion. I would entertain a motion. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve the employment agreement between the City of Verona and Mary Hansen. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. A second would be in order. Second. Thank you, Mr. Baer. Any discussion? Ms. Rieke? I had the pleasure of attending um, the second interview for this candidate and uh, concur that she was the best of the people that I saw. So they were all very high quality um, potential employees, but I think um, I'm glad that she's going to be the one. All right, very good, thank you. Mr. Bear. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I wanna echo that as well. I think we had a great process for uh, selection and, and really have found a, a very high quality candidate to lead our senior center. She's got great, great uh, leadership potential and a good vision for uh, how to move this forward and came <coughs> very, very well prepared to uh, the personnel committee meetings and interviews. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Mr. Burns for all the work he did on, on this to get us uh, to this point. Um, and I think we also owe a, a thanks to Mr. Steiner who attended the interviews and Mr. Jim Sweet from the Verona area active adults for uh, providing some input at the interviews and helping us through that process. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else? Well, congratulations to Ms. Hansen and we welcome you uh, to the city of Verona as an employee. Look forward to having her. Um, we've heard the this, uh, motion and the second. All those in favor of approving the employment agreement between Mary Hansen and the city of Verona signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion passes. We will move on to item 10, new business. Uh, discussion of possible action, presentation of the fire and EMS facility schematic design and preliminary cost estimates and directions on proceeding with the design development phase. I'll note that we have uh, Mr. Gosselman here and uh, Bill Pornar here from Tri-North. So if we have any questions as we move forward, they can certainly answer that. I believe they're gonna do a presentation. Bill, do you have Anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, just uh, would mention that uh, the city's agreement uh, with Five Bugles uh, included uh, multiple phases, a uh, schematic design phase, which we're approaching the end of uh, now, uh, the detailed design phase, and then preparation of construction documents and construction. Uh, so the presentation tonight is gonna be on that schematic design phase. Uh, there have been various iterations that have been reviewed by the ad hoc committee. And uh, the committee, I believe, has is, is generally been supportive um, of the uh, the plan that is before us. There are a couple items that were discussed at the last meeting, uh, which Mr. McGowan uh, will go forward uh, with. Then we will have um, Bill uh, Punoyer from uh, Tri North Construction providing additional information on the construction cost estimates. And then I also have some additional information uh, that was prepared by the finance director in conjunction with Ellers on the uh, financial uh, cost and impact, uh, which we can go through tonight. Um, then this item would be available for discussion and potential action um, by the body uh, if desired this evening and that action would be to accept the schematic design and give direction on proceeding with the phase two design development process. All right, I believe Mr. Gaussman, you will start off. Good evening, Steve Gaussman with Five Bugles Design built from uh, Trinorth. Uh, <coughs> on behalf of both Five Bugles and Trinorth, Steve, do you have, is your mic, mic on? It gets, it's tough for people to hear. We're adaptable. There you go. Uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to make us, let us make this presentation tonight. Uh, the, uh, the presentation you're going to see is, is uh, fairly close to the last presentation that we made to the ad hoc committee. We made a few minor iterations along and added a, a second additional bay that we'll put in front of you as, as well. Uh, a little bit of past history. Uh, Five Bugles Design has been involved with your fire and EMS uh, facility. We've made a couple of programming trips uh, starting a couple, of, a couple of years ago when we were selected. We took that programming information that was right around 40,000 square feet and uh, with the two chiefs and Bill sat down in, in, in detailed review sessions, went through and, and really itemized all the equipment, the spaces, where the spaces needed to go with each other. From there, we've developed what I would consider maybe three uh, completely different concepts. Uh, the one that you're going to see tonight probably has a good half dozen iterations. Uh, all three concepts developed with what you see in front of you is uh, 
in red is approximately a 40,000 square foot fire station with egress directly onto, with either seven or eight bays, directly onto uh, Verona. Uh, we've really set the building up so it occupies a very prominent site. And from that intersection, we wanted the ability to have a, a, a view of the building, both of the, the bays, but there's a, a large training component in the building. There's uh, some tremendous history that we wanted to take advantage of. There's some a antique fire apparatus, as well as a, a monument that the fire and EMS department have asked that we allow uh, space for. The building is a drive-through configuration, all seven, or if you wish, eight bays, would be a drive-through configuration. On the south s side, where, we, where you can see command vehicles, there would be four suburban type vehicles that would discharge from the rear of the building. Building set up, or the site plan set up, so that we would have a total of uh, 65 uh, staff parking. We've dashed in, to the, in that we can accommodate as much as 125 if you give us that direction. Uh, we have revised the plan to basically have uh, two methods of entry. Uh, off of the side street for returning apparatus. One of the things that we've talked a great deal about is how to keep your existing station operational. And uh, what we've compromised on is doing selective demolition and removing the apparatus, or the, I'm sorry, the administration, administrative wing of your existing fire station, keeping the uh, existing operational base uh, operational 24-7 through construction. Uh, when we first started laying it out, we were looking at a phased approach that would have had us constructing the apparatus base first on the new addition, removing all of it and going back. And where we're at now is, is uh, considerably less expensive. The floor plan, uh, what we ultimately presented to the uh, ad hoc committee, again, is a seven bay configuration. I would put to you that that virtually all seven bays are full. We have uh, space for one or two uh, additional vehicles. And with the exception of an admin uh, person, a plan reviewer that is scheduled to be put on place and a couple of dorm rooms, most of the, uh, most if not all of the uh, spaces within the building are spoken for as well. Uh, again, what you're seeing in green is a, a public lo lobby along with the, uh, what I would call the antique. I can tell my, my uh, try using the mouse instead. There we go. The antique uh, fire truck would occupy a, a prominent area in the front of the building. Uh, a, a large training room with, a, with a, a kitchen off it would be open to the public. We'd be able to close those areas down at night. What, we, what you're seeing in yellow wrapping around the south side would be fire and EMS offices. Uh, fire and EMS turnout gear would be located throughout here. Uh, separated in their own two bays are ambulance where we've, we have a lower roof and we've environmentally separated the two areas for EMS since they're making uh, uh, a much higher volume of runs. We wanted to control that apparatus bays here, uh, decontamination wash bays here, command vehicles here. Uh, upon presenting this, ad hoc committee asked us to, to come back and pr uh, prepare documents with eight bays, and we've done that. That's what you're looking at now. It's a future bay, and uh, there were members on the committee that thought you should consider it just because of the volume that it, it would be far cheaper now to put on that eighth bay and allow for, for future flexibility that, than it sometime in the future. The, this slide indicates what happens on the upper floor. Uh, a fire station is much like a house. There are, there are pri private areas, semi-public areas, and public areas. What's happening on the upper floor isn't inherently private areas. Uh, what you're seeing is in green, dormitory spaces for the fire department in uh, that uh, kind of maroon 
would be seven EMS storms. Common areas in yellow would be day room, kitchen, exercise facilities, mechanical room. And in the light blue would be intern, uh, an intern suite. The upper floor really is divided into three separate suites, fire, EMS, and the interns, the, the interns and, and uh, the chief is here. Uh, he can certainly speak to it more than, than I can. Uh, interns are, we're finding them more and more frequently in departments where it's, it's really a, a, a training aid and you're bringing students on. And we need to give, the, this is their home away from home. When they're on duty, they will actually be bunking in, in the fire bunks. But when they're not on duty, they need an apartment, if you will, to go, to go back to. And frequently, uh, Mount Horb, for instance, they're, they're living off campus in, in their own house. And uh, what they're planning on in their new station is a, a situation very similar to this. To arrive at the architecture that we're going to show you, we've, uh, we've performed a number of case studies. Uh, during the interview process, it came back to us that the ad hoc committee was particularly interested in the architecture of two buildings. This would be in front of you is the Middleton Fire Station and the Mars Marshfield Fire Station, both of which are uh, very high quality buildings. Uh, <clears throat> both facilities went through a unique architectural design progression. Middleton, we spent a, a number of evenings talking about the type of architecture that they desired for that site and, and actually they kept coming back to a, an early 1900s Chicago uh, fire station. Marshfield, uh, we actually sat down with their historical society and, and uh, reviewed uh, buildings that had, had been demolished in Marshfield and tied in those architectural elements. Both of these buildings uh, I thought were, were uh, great examples, but for the type of, of uh, suburban area where our site is going to be located, they, they didn't seem to me to be the, the type of proper vernacular that would fit in. Uh, I, I brought back a slide of a, a building that was a prairie style building out of Elmhurst, uh, Illinois, as something that possibly might be more suitable. And of course, we wanted to, to tie it in with uh, the campus effect of the, the Verona City Center. Uh, this is an elevation that ultimately we put together for your review. And uh, the last slide is a, a rendered elevation of what that might look like. And that pretty much does my presentation. I know Bill's here to answer any questions. I would certainly uh, answer any questions on our process or the design or uh, costs or anything else that comes up. Thank you, Steve. I, I will note that there are a couple of people here who are on the ad hoc committee who if, if there are any questions from the council that you'd like to ask the committee or the process, they've, they've uh, said they'd be happy to talk, uh, answer questions. Mr. Manley. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Steve, at one of the ad hoc committee meetings, we saw um, a site plan that would have kept, I think, uh, better than what's shown here, the incoming uh, apparatus traffic away from the, the uh, motor vehicle traffic that would be in the parking lot. That's correct. And I wonder if, I mean, it just seems to me that it's a good idea to keep, when the apparatuses are returning to the site and have to get their way around the backside of the, 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 the fire station, that keeping them away from the flow of motor vehicle traffic for, for anyone who might be visiting the site is a good idea. Correct. Our, our initial recommendation was to have an access road, if you will, coming off uh, down near the southern edge of the, the, the property, coming around the brick, the brick building and coming back uh, around in a circular fashion. This way to completely segregate returning apparatus from uh, either the staff or public parking. Upon review, uh, the, the ad hoc committee uh, directed us to take a look at removing that return lane, saving the money for it, 
and actually bringing the apparatus back through here. We have calculated out the turning radiuses and we can make the apparatus work as well as that. And we've left a, a back through bay for backing up. Some of the apparatus will actually be discharging secondary units coming out this way, but that's the history of it. Is there a, a significant cost savings with with this type of a configuration as opposed to having the the separate lane? Yeah, the amount of asphalt wasn't a very significant cost. I think it was maybe about twenty five thousand dollars of savings. Okay, thank you. Thank you. First off, <clears throat> I want to say I, I there are a vast greater number of things I love about this station than I would detract from it. And I think it's um, a good thing that the city is looking into um, a, a building like this and a building this size. I mean, we're a growing city and I, um, I appreciate the foresight that went into this building, building it larger so that we can grow into it, um, as well as the police station. Um, I also like that EMS and fire are going to be housed together. I think it'll allow them to build a better bond, um, which will help out as well. One question I have. Um, how much do fire poles cost? Uh, I would be taking a stab at it, but I would say probably around twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars. And <clears throat> I would agree with Mr. Manley um, in that I, I did appreciate having that return drive, um, and I guess I would rather see something like that than a fire pole when we already have the staircase. Um, I think it's. To me, I, do we want to spend $30,000 and we already have a staircase there? Um, and so if someone could, uh, either one of the chiefs or, or somebody kind of go over the need for the fire pole. Good evening. I, I wouldn't say there's a need for a fire pole, but uh, fire pole statistic. In, in the early 70s, fire poles went out of favor and they quit installing them in fire stations in lieu of stairs. Uh, they thought the insurance company, it thought it was more expensive, they have more injuries with fire poles. Since then, they've done a study with the insurance companies and I think Steve can back me up on this. I've not, I don't have any data to show up, but from what I've heard, statistically, greater injuries happen falling down stairways than they do sliding down the pole. Uh, the pole is a historic thing in the fire service. The fire service is about a lot of his history in the fire service. And when you have the kids come in from the schools for a tour of the fire station, one of the first questions they ask, where's the fire pole? And we don't have one. It's twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. It will be used by the firefighters. I understand the EMS personnel don't want the fire pole. There's no pole in their portion of the station. This will be used primarily by the firefighters. Um, it's a... It's a nice PR thing to have. It does speed up the response of the firefighters to get down off the second floor. Personally, I've been in the fire service 35 years. I've never slid a pole, but a lot of people do. And they've made it a resurgent. I think almost every one of the new fire stations we looked at had poles installed in them. And with regard to the drive, uh, we did not want the drive for a couple reasons. One, uh, we see a real problem with parking at uh, hometown days, trying to keep people out of there to keep that access open for the fire trucks during that time. So we didn't want to have that problem. We like the idea of having more green space than having more asphalt. Uh, most of the trucks will back in from the front, except for the ladder truck is the only truck that will drive through from the rear and the two tankers will back in from the rear. So there's not a lot of traffic coming through that parking lot. And when it is, it's returning traffic that's non-emergency, going slow. And we've been doing that since 1976, I believe, at the current fire station. And we've, we've never had a problem with it. So that was the reasons for not doing the drive. Uh, you know, I can't say we got to have a, if we don't have a fire pole, we're not going to have a fire station. But I think it's a, it's a nice, if it's maybe one of the things you need to have, you want to have, that's probably a want more than a need. But it's, it's something that really goes to the history of a fire station. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Yours? Yeah, I, I appreciate that answer. And um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I am one person who really appreciates history. I mean, I, um, I've, I've studied it a great deal. Uh, and I do love the section of the, of the department that has the antique engine. Um, but when you look at the overall cost of, of this building, I think we do need to weigh our wants and needs a little, a little bit here. And I, 
I think we could do without the fire pole personally. Um, like I said, I, I, love the, I, I love nostalgia and I love history um, just as much as the next person. Um, but when you're, when you're spending that kind of money, I'd, I'd like to be there to be a little bit more of a functional purpose or a need necessarily than a want. Um, so that, that, that's one comment. And then the other comment I had on, was on the doors. Um, is there, what, with the timing of the doors, how, how much faster do the, the doors planned for this station have than the standard garage door? Oh, it's significant. Uh, uh, depending on, on the operator on a, a, a sectional overhead door, you're probably 45 seconds, and uh, a bifold door is, is typically around four, four and a half seconds. You're, you're easily saving 40 to 45 seconds for, uh, and, and on response time, particularly when you're looking at getting to somebody within four minutes, that's, you'd be hard pressed to, uh, to uh, pick up uh, a, a time savings more than that. The, the doors are quite expensive compared to a sectional door. They're uh, uh, probably 30, 35,000 as opposed to what, six to eight, depending on the amount of glass that, that we put in. So it's a, it's a substantial undertaking. Uh, having said that, as you put in uh, sectional overhead doors, uh, they tend to have more and more problems the larger they get, and these are 14 by 14 doors. Uh, the bifolds, we've simply never had a problem with them. They, they're, they're not even the, the same kind of animal. They're, uh, they're completely different. And they create a much tighter weather seal as well than an overhead sectional door. So there are energy concerns with them as well. And then just the last comment I wanted to make, I really want to commend the fire department for uh, wanting to move into the internship program here in Verona. I think that's a great program. I want to see that move forward. Um, any opportunity we can give somebody to start a career um, at a lower cost, and especially a profession that's going to work to uh, serve the public, I think that's an, that's an opportunity we should, we should jump on. So I want to commend the fire department for that as well. Thank you. I would note that there, there was a considerable amount of uh, discussion meaning that I was at concerning the, the overhead doors and the cost versus the, the savings related to environmental costs, uh, energy, that kind of thing. Not to mention, it, w those doors tend to get hit more often, the doors, the overhead doors, as opposed to the bifold doors because of the, just the nature of the height of the truck versus the, the, the slowness of the, uh, um, the overhead door. And, and typically because they're emergency personnel and they want to get out the door and get to the emergency, they're looking to get out as quickly as possible. So they did have some anecdotal information at the meeting that, talking about just those kinds of things. So that's why we thought it was important to at least include those doors in the initial uh, mock-up so that we could have this discussion. Anyone else? Mr. Bear. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm curious about the, the differences in uh, operations and cost, and I think we'll get to cost later um, but operations particularly between the seven, <coughs> ba seven bay option and the eight bay option um, and sort of what the demand will be in the future that would justify seven or eight or, you know, wh why, are, why are there options, I guess, is the question. Go ahead. <coughs> when we first started talking to the fire station, we looked at the uh, bar three, uh, studies showed that we were around 40,000 square feet. Uh, the goal of this building was to be a 30, 40, 50 year building. And currently, as stated earlier, when we move in the fire station, the day we move in, when it's completed, we'll have basically two empty offices on the first floor and one empty stall for one vehicle. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what is in store for the Verona Fire Department 20, 30 years down the road. I'm not going to fall on my sword saying I have to have this eighth bay. It would certainly, uh, it would certainly be the time to do it if we we're ever going to do it. Um, I cannot say that it's going to be full. We would certainly use it for training and staging of equipment and stuff. And if uh, EMS has an ambulance that's out of service, it could be stored there. There's county resources, there's the command post, there's uh, mass casualty trailers that have been, that are stored at fire departments 
we could have one of those. You know, do we want to be storing county assets? That's a decision for you guys to make. Uh, with the bays at seven, we would not be able to do that most likely as we only have the one empty truck bay. And that bay is empty right now, so the ladder can drive through. If we put a truck in there, the ladder won't be able to drive through. It'll have to back in from the front. You know, the, I, as I said, the first floor is pretty much going to be full on the day we move in. That doesn't give us a lot of room for growth if there is any. Uh, fire apparatus are changing all the time. They're getting bigger instead of smaller. I, I can't predict if it's going to be absolutely needed or not. It would certainly be a well thought out, a good discussion to have. Do we really need to have it or not? I, I certainly think the option of having it is better than the option of not having it, but there's a cost associated as well. It's additional square footage. It certainly puts us over the 40,000, but I can't say, you know, that in two years we're going to have X trucks sitting in there or anything, but in the county with the county resources are always possibly something can be in there like i said we could use it for training in the winter time uh, we can have people come in and train in the bay where it's warm and stuff is versus being outside or in the training tower there's no heat thank you it, it, maybe now would be a good time to just talk about a follow-up question on that sure. thank you I, is storing county assets is that something that can generate revenue for the city you know i'm not sure i don't believe do you guys know? I don't believe that we used to have a county hazmat trailer, was it? Decon trailer? And we didn't. I don't believe we paid anything. They paid us anything for that. I, okay. I'm pretty sure Fitchburg provides storage for CV1, and they even provide people to drive it to wherever it needs to be. And I don't think they're, they might be reimbursed for the cost of the personnel to take it there, but I don't think they receive anything for storing it. All right. Thank you. I, I, I think it's worth noting that when we did our initial uh, schematic designs and started out, we, it was our recommendation to look at eight bays, and we, we had eight bays uh, during, a, uh, during ways that we were looking at paring the building down. Uh, that bay came up because we didn't have uh, specific, uh, a specific need, in, uh, current need for it, so it came out. And at the last ad hoc meeting, it, it came back up uh, as a discussion. So that's kind of the, it was, it, it was in, it was out, now it's right. Back and, on the table. and I think I would, I would be comfortable and, and would want to see maybe some data behind this and, and why you decided on eight over seven if that is the, mm -hmm. the ultimate decision. So, I, you know, just to be able to talk intelligently about it and make an informed decision on eight over seven. And the design of the station does not lend to adding in any additions to it in the future. That we, we have told them that we are not interested in that. If down the road we need something more, we'll look at a satellite station at that point. So, Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Diaz. Thank you. I just had a, a comment and a question. Um, one, as long as the needs of the fire department can be met with less impervious services, that's, that's great by me. Um, and my question is, since we're looking at this as like a 30 to 50 year building, I'm wondering what kind of considerations um, have gone into the, like the operating costs and, and energy efficiencies and things like that. We, we brought down our uh, lead team uh, early on and and had some discussions and uh, basically what we got what we what I took out of that meeting is we're looking at constructing uh, a, a lead caliber building that will be self uh, uh, it'll be a self supporting or, or self performing lead but certainly to that end we will we will be putting in a higher performing building and actually once we start going through design development uh, we'll be sitting down having interactive meetings going through all the different systems payback requirements payback uh, uh, in order to give you what you're looking for we had by the way just kind of roughed out a cost for just the whole certification process and that's probably close to fifty thousand dollars just for all the paperwork and it, I think the consensus was it was better to spend that money on the building than it was on, on paperwork and that you could still end up with a sustainable energy efficient building Thank you. Mr. Yours. Um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. President, if it would be appropriate, if you would allow it, um, could, since I see a lot of um, public safety professionals out there, could we ask them if they have any comments and feedback on the, on the presentation or, or the building, since they're the, they're the ones who are going to be living in it and working in it? Well, typically we don't have public comment in the middle of a, a, a setting, but if, uh, if there is someone who would feel strongly about it and hasn't been represented by what the chief has said, I'd be happy to entertain that. If you could keep it to less than two minutes so we can keep it moving, that'd be great. 
anyone and don't be intimidated. It's, it's not e any easier up here than it, than it is right there. <laughs> the camera works both ways. Anyone? Okay. Mr. Burns. I, I was just going to suggest you might want to have Bill go through the cost sure. portion and then we can continue the discussion. Bill? Costs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think if you could just uh, <laughs> kind of walk through, they, they do have sure. in their packets um, the original construction estimate, and then you, I know you had emailed me some other options, so right. if you can address those. Our, our initial budget started out at $9,143,779,000. Sorry, $9, sorry. Um, basically, this budget was based on the first uh, design, which was slightly over uh, 40,000 square feet, uh, 40,282, I believe. And, and the basis for that uh, budget, because at that time, again, this is early in the design phase, so we don't have documents with details, with finishes, with mechanical systems specified, this type of thing. What we used was the Marshfield and really the Middleton fire stations as kind of the, uh, the baseline or the barometer of finishes, systems, uh, type of construction. And with today's current uh, costs that have gone up, uh, I would say fairly probably significantly because uh, a lot of this was done and uh, prior to some rather significant material increases. So that's why that the cost is where it is. And I, I do want to say again, when we do a preliminary budget like this with, a, with this type of a baseline, we are probably more conservative than we are aggressive because uh, we've found in the past no one wants to find out that you underestimated and then you've committed to a certain dollar amount dollar amount and then you have overruns. So until this documents would be completed and would go out for actual bids uh, with contractors, we won't know the uh, actual amount, but this is kind of a best uh, best guess at this time based on, uh, again, mostly the Marshfield uh, as a baseline. The, the one difference with the current cost that we have now, if you look at the uh, sheet that Bill put together, we looked at two other things. Uh, we looked at doing masonry rather than precast. And it was, uh, I think, the decision, uh, you know, again, unanimous that for a $644,000 savings, that with proper detailing and quality control, that an equally sound and uh, lasting, durable building could be built in masonry as much as precast. So that uh, $644,000 savings. Uh, was deducted. Uh, that's been a big shift in the construction industry. Five, six years ago, precast wouldn't have cost you more money, uh, but su supply and demand, it, it has gotten more expensive. And then the other thing we looked at also was the concern with enough storage and that maybe it would make sense. We're already digging down a, a foundation to put in a, at least a partial basement. So even though there's no drawing of a basement yet, what we did is we looked at kind of what would be an economical way based on the structure to get some basement in there with really a minimum of about 4,000 square feet, which is about what the Marshfield fire station had. So we ended up with a 4,200 square foot basement. Again, that worked out with the structure of the column lines, those type of things. And that was an ad of uh, $231,000. And again, I think most people uh, agreed that that was probably some money well spent. You can't go back and build a basement uh, later on and have that, you know, versatile space, storage space. So that taking the masonry credit and the addition for the basement that ended up with eight million seven hundred thirty thousand four hundred thirty-three dollars of construction costs. And I know then Bill put together a lot of the other soft costs as we we like to call them, and most of these were based on. Uh, history from other projects. Since then, a couple things uh, have come up. Uh, there were some tweaks to the design that ended up uh, this coming in a little under the $40,000 or 40,000 square foot target. That saved about $79,000. And then we took a look at adding the additional bays, which was an increase of about $292,000, which Square footage wise compared to the square footage of the rest of the facility is is considerably lower uh, because there's a lot of economy in just extending that out. And as the chief mentioned before, the design does not lend itself to an addition at a later time. It's obviously a lot more economical to to build it at this time. So that's kind of the the, the history 
of the costs. Again, we looked at lead, we looked at different types of construction, and I think at this point, to get a uh, durable, uh, energy efficient building, uh, what seemed like the criteria was, and the type of exterior design that is currently drawn, the prairie style, that's pretty much where the numbers are right now. Thank you. Mr. Steiner. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, when you talked about that 4,000 square foot storage space in a basement, a red flag went up in my memory. When we built this city center, we decided to put in a storage space below ground, and we have huge moisture problems there. Hardly anything can be stored there, especially if it's paper. Uh, have you given that any thought? Well, one of the things we did talk about is there has not been soil borings taken to date, still my understanding. So we would learn more when there are soil borings of the soil capacity, water table level, those types of things. At that point, we could find out something that makes that, you know, prohibitive. But to date, we don't have that kind of information. And again, that's even like when we talked about the masonry versus the precast, that really depends on you know, two things, design, detailing, and then quality control. If, if we know the condition of the soils and the uh, elevation of the water table, certainly uh, Five Bugles is going to design a building that's not going to have issues. And, and if it's built correctly, with, uh, th there's no reason for that. There's got to be something why that happened. No, we've yeah, it's called groundwater. And this area where you're talking about building it is a collection of groundwater and it feeds a, a nice stream into Badger Mill. And I, I think you better look at this real closely because I would be more in favor of that 4,000 square foot storage uh, added on above ground where you could control the environment and especially if our chief and the fire people want to save things like paper, cardboard. We would agree if it, as soon as, if, the, if, if we have a high water table in there, we'd be the first ones that would come back to you and say, this is a bad idea. Yeah. And again, you can spend money. We're building some apartment <coughs> buildings right now on just west of the Capitol where we're going down 30, 40 feet, you know, right between the two lakes with, and we have pumps running constantly and there'll be a dewatering system permanently in these buildings in the parking levels. So it's costly. There are ways of dealing with it, but it costs money. And at that point, as Steve's saying, there would be an evaluation that, okay, the water table's at this level. We're going to be below the water table. Here's the cost implications, not just during construction, but even if the, there's permanent dewatering systems, all that would have to be evaluated, but we really don't know that yet till we do soil borings. So, I mean, it, point well taken. We just don't know that information yet. Thank you, Bill. And uh, Mr. Burns. Uh, yeah, we, we have discussed um, the need for soil borings. I've discussed that with the Public Works Director, uh, Mr. Reeder. He's certainly very familiar with the issues that we had in this building. And working with the architect, we've identified locations for the soil borings. And the city is going to be contracting uh, with our soils consultant directly to make sure that we get that information. And then once we have that, I, I think then we do need to have that evaluation of what are the conditions, does that make sense, and, and we'll make that decision during the phase two process once we have that soil boring data. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm curious, does this uh, cost analysis include changes that would have to happen to East Verona Avenue? No, we do not have any, uh, any sort of infrastructure improvements. Is that something the, the committee has looked at or thought about or something that uh, would come to Public Works Committee? I would say we haven't, at Public Works, we haven't had the discussion because up until this point, there hasn't been a definitive plan to necessarily right, right. look at and how it would come into uh, East Verona Avenue there. Okay. Mr. Yers. I, I see Mr. Sayers in the room and also um, Mr. Burns may be able to answer this question as well. Um, are those improvements to Verona Avenue, is that part of the downtown study? Yes, uh, improvements to the intersection at Lincoln and Verona Avenue, um, including a signal, is a recommendation in the downtown study. Uh, it's also something that we've discussed uh, internally at, at, at a staff level at our, our TRC <coughs> meetings and something that we'd be looking at in our capital improvement process, uh, but that's not part of these cost estimates for the fire station. Any other questions? 
I do have one. I'm um, given that we're talking about masonry. Am, am I assuming and correctly assuming that we'd be, if this, this body decided to go forward, would be talking about an early spring start, and we'd be done with our masonry work by, by the time winter flies. So we're not talking about the heating costs and those. That's kind our of intention. Yeah. yeah. Right now the schedule calls for a July start. And I was talking with Mr. Burns prior to the meeting that. It would probably make sense to look at multiple bid packages and move up that start time, you know, get the foundation designed so that we could uh, minimize or even eliminate the uh, winter construction costs because they can be quite costly. This, this winter is a good example of that. I would, I would say that absolutely we would want to move forward so, as much as possible. Yeah, we talked about that prior to the meeting actually that we'd like to strategize, put together a schedule right now which starting uh, 1st of July we'd be done. Uh, late March but I think you could not only help out that overall schedule but again minimize those winter construction costs and the way you would do that would be multiple bid packages that way the design isn't complete but you can start construction okay. thank you <coughs> any other questions Ms. Riki uh, it seems like most of the people who have spoken with me about this are in favor of adding the extra bay at this time because it would be less costly to do it now rather than later um, but they were um, seemed to be a more more skeptical about so many parking stalls so could you speak to that a little bit about how how often 105 parking stalls would be used I, and and for what purposes sure be happy to uh, <clears throat> uh, originally we proposed 65 stalls and and discussion with staff and the departments on, on training to maximize that training room, it was suggested that we take a, take a look at bouncing up to a 125 stalls. We did that and I think the common consens consensus that I came away from that committee meeting is uh, let's take it back down to the 65 stalls, show areas where we can expand into uh, up to a maximum of, of 125, but uh, at least that's uh, my thoughts on the direction. And so the presentation that you see tonight is 65 stalls. Is Did I speak accurately to, to that, Bill? Yeah, I, I think that that's a correct. Uh, and there was discussion uh, at the ad hoc committee. Uh, that was also one of the comments from, from the city planner to, to look at the amount of parking and uh, to potentially reduce that and allow for expansion if it's needed. Uh, one of the issues that, that we'll need to work through is just ensuring that if there is an event in the training room, that there is a way to segregate stalls uh, for firefighters. So if there's a call that they have access to parking and can get to the station. And w with the understanding that we need to work through that, I, I think we can look at the lower parking amount. At this point, I'd like to have Bill go through the five-year CIP. Just, we've been talking about this as a body, whether it's part of the former agreement with the town or as an independent uh, body taking this on for quite some time. But I think it's important to look at what that does to our 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 uh, investments in the five-year plan and and what it means for for debt and debt service. I know a lot of you are hearing about debt and debt service and I think it's worthwhile that we at least go through this and what this means moving forward. So Bill, if you could. Yeah, in, included in the packet in addition to the construction estimate from Tri-North is, is a sheet labeled uh, Fire and EMS Facility Project Estimates and that was attempting to look at the construction costs as well as some of the other soft and equipment costs, um, architect, construction manager, uh, furniture, equipment, um, various systems. Um, a number of those items are are essentially placeholders or examples looking at other projects and again we've tried to be conservative here as well um, at, at this point in the process but based on on the size facility we're looking at and the type of construction and the quality uh, we're looking at approximately a 10 million dollar facility based on the estimates at this point and we had provided that information to our financial advisors at Ellers and asked them to look at the city's uh, current five-year capital improvement plan uh, we've already borrowed $500,000 for this project uh, to get started with some of the professional services. Uh, so then they looked at if we were doing a total of an additional $9.5 million of borrowing over the next two years for this project, what impact that would be. 
And so there are three sheets in your packet uh, prepared by Ehlers. Uh, the first one is labeled uh, Summary of Options, um, and it has a base case in yellow, um, shows our five-year capital improvement plan with no fire station, in blue, that five-year CIP plus a $9.5 million of additional borrowing, and then compares the difference um, between the CIP with and without the fire station. Uh, so we are anticipating that our tax rate for debt service um, will be increasing, and that would be true regardless of whether or not we add the fire station or not based on, on the projects that are in our plan. But the impact of adding the additional fire station at this cost is about 50 cents on the mill rate, um, or about $135 per year on the average home at $272,000 based on the last revaluation. Uh, I should uh, let people know that the assumptions behind this, I believe, are conservative, um, and they're included in um, the second and third pages in here. Um, Ellers looks at our historic growth, then they take an average of that <coughs> and they discount that uh, to be conservative. So this does not include any additional new growth um, beyond that discounted average. Uh, for example, it does not include Epic uh, Campus 4 or 5. This does not consider the impact of the Epic TIF closing. Uh, it's just trying to look at kind of a base level of development, um, other projects that we have planned, and then the impact of the fire station. Um, so certainly there, there is a, a, a significant, significant cost when you're looking at an approximately $10 million facility, uh, but we thought it's helpful to kind of break that down into what that means on the rate and what that could mean, um, at least on an average value home, and then you can extrapolate from there. The last of, of the three pages uh, for your reference is just our planned five-year capital improvement plan based on what was uh, presented and discussed as part of the last budget process. So that lists by year for 2014 through 2018 uh, planned projects and estimated costs. And we would be reviewing this again um, this spring and into summer as we work on our 2014 issue. And of course, this is subject to change up until when we approve the borrowing in any one of these years. Uh, but for planning purposes, we try to look at known projects and estimated costs so we can make decisions as we look at individual projects like this in the larger context. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Any questions for Mr. Burns? None? Mr. Mann. Thank you. Uh, I know that one of the things that a number of us have been concerned about is our is our overall debt load, and certainly um, this would would add to it. Have have we calculated out where we would be relative to state limitations and city policy in terms of the amount of uh, the, the ratio of of debt to equalize value? Yeah, uh, the short answer is yes, that that has been looked at. In addition to these uh, three summary pages, Ellers has provided um, detailed schedules that shows by year what the issues would look like and what the total debt service is. Um, I know that based on those projections, that is um, projecting that we would be consistent with both city policy and state statute. Uh, I can follow up with specifically what the projected percentages would be in each given year, but they would be consistent with those limits. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Diaz. I just have a quick question. So since the fire department's going to be serving both the city and the town, how much of the debt load does the town have for the new fire station? Well, the, the, so that with the, it being a city department, they don't have the debt load. And that was part of the issue with dissolving the district to begin with because the town wasn't interested in taking on the debt that would be necessary to build a fire department. So at this point, they would get services based on fees paid, which is part of the agreement that was worked out beforehand. And, and the city has 100% of the debt then? That is correct. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I, I wanted to just add to that as well that as part of the agreement uh, between the city and the town, uh, the town did relinquish their share of the current um, value of the facility and the land and provided that to city. It, the city is basically an in-kind contribution, if you will, towards the new agreement. Um, the town has also made the commitment that since the city has established a fire impact fee, uh, that they would also be collecting um, an equivalent amount from any new development within the town and paying that to the city to go towards this project. Uh, there's not a, a lot of development in the town, so certainly the majority of funds that would come in from the impact fee would be from, from city development, uh, but there would be some payments potentially coming in from the town from that source. 
And I should add that um, these uh, numbers that we presented are net of projected impact fees, although again, we've been conservative on our estimates um, for what we anticipate to collect from that impact fee. Ms. Doyle. Yeah. Thank you for putting all that together, Mr. Burns. And I actually just wanted to go back and bug the, the chief for a little bit here. Um, if in planning for long term, I do concur with Ms. Ricky that we probably should go ahead and add that eighth bay on now if the numbers warrant, but also with the office space, with most of it already being spoken for, how does that play into the long term plan? We're, we're not anticipating any great increases in staff. Uh, kind of our fallback position is the museum area that we're planning for the uh, antique fire truck, the uh, antique uh, ladder cart and hose cart. That would be areas that would potentially be able to be used if we did need greater office space. We could section that off and use that for additional office space. But I don't, I'm not real concerned about additional office space because the numbers, we've, we've looked at it pretty strongly on what we need for staff and I don't see an, a large increase in that. But there again, I don't have a crystal ball. But but we would have the option with the museum space of, of cordoning that off and using it for office space. So this is on um, for possible action. Um, I'm, I'm thinking there's a lot of information here, a lot of information for the public to, to take in. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions that you all will get because it's a, a not an insignificant amount of money for sure. So. I would certainly be uh, comfortable with waiting the additional two weeks to the next uh, council meeting to either give direction or if the body is comfortable, I, I would entertain that too. If, and was I too vague? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Yours. Um, just for everyone's benefit, could you explain again um, if we did move forward, um, you know, what's set in stone, what's not set in stone, kind of. Uh, just explain the process again. I for think everyone. Mr. Burns said you could speak more to the agreement because it's there's two phases to the development of the plan, which is the schematic, and then you would start moving forward into the actual development of the building and plans. Mr. Burns? I, yeah, that, that's correct. We had split our agreement with five bugles uh, into two phases, uh, the schematic design, uh, which would include the feasibility analysis, and then the phase two design development and proceeding through construction documents and, and uh, the construction process. Um, I, I think at this point, uh, Eller, or Five Bugles has, has prepared the information um, for a schematic design. Um, per that agreement, that needs to be accepted by the council and provide them with direction to proceed with the phase two design development. Um, and perhaps if we could have uh, Mr. Gausman address just kind of where they're at and, and the timeline and, and what direction you're looking for from the body as far as what is set at the schematic design phase versus what you'll be looking at in phase two. I'm sure we'll be happy to. Uh, we are at at our, uh, in, in fact, at, we've probably gone over uh, the limits of our uh, conceptual design. We we brought a, a number of uh, of uh, lead professionals in uh, early on, so I'm very comfortable where we're at on our our concept right now. I think what we're looking for is if we move ahead, getting back uh, to the questions you brought up on on the type of doors and poles and and basements certainly basements all those are going to happen in a in a very uh regimented fashion of review and if it's with the the ad hoc committee if you can if you'd like us to keep working through theirs but there'll be a number of i would imagine monthly check-ins and looking for direction on on which way to, there's an awful lot of decisions to be made on everything from brick color to, uh, uh, you know, to window types and, and, and what have you. So I, I think uh, moving ahead, we were talking about schedule with, with Tri-North and we're, we're certainly uh, ready to go and the sooner that we can get ready for multiple bid packages, uh, in my mind, the better off we'll be. Uh, it'll certainly come back in front of the, the council when when uh, construction documents are are completed for your approval to, to put it out for for bids along with an updated cost estimate and along with all those other decisions in front of you
take, I, why don't we just do it this way? <laughs> so I was just asking Bill, um, <coughs> just to the cut to the chase, they're done with as much as they can do right now. So at this point, they're looking for the city to give them direction, which is the next step. Do they continue on with this? Are we comfortable with them moving forward from this point into the next step, which actually be developing documents that they could send out for bid, which more or less ties the city down that path. Not, it, you can certainly step back away from it at any time, but we would have to vote on that at some point. Mr. Burns? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to, to make the point that I, I was making to, to the president that uh, I, I think the main decision that we're looking at is that the direction was looking at a, a approximately 40,000 square foot building. Uh, we, we have that in front of us at this point. Um, there is this question about whether the additional bay is included. I think that's a good point to provide direction on. I think some of the other details, as Mr. Galsman indicated, the, the pole, the doors, mechanical systems, those are, are decisions that can come in phase two, but, but the question for the body at this point of are you generally comfortable with this concept and this approximate square footage and do we want to give them direction to proceed with those other decision points? I, thank you, Mr. President. I, I liked your original recommendation of waiting a couple of weeks and getting some feedback from the public on this and, and simply because of the size of the project, the amount of money included in, in the project, I think I'd like to hear a little more, or at least give the public the opportunity to provide some input input into this design before we go any further. Um, it's just, you know, $10 million is not an insignificant amount of money for this city, obviously, and I think we might be a little hasty by making a, a decision tonight to move forward any further. Um, and that being said, I, I do have a couple other clarifying questions, if I could. Um, I'm curious if in the design phase, whether the architect or the committee ever thought or considered a, a, a plan that could be added on to in the future? So a smaller scale project today that could be added on to later as demand? Uh, we considered it, but uh, based on the programming that we did and the, the need uh, kept coming back to 40,000 square feet, that the direction that we had and the direction we explored was always taking care of all the needs up front. Okay. And I guess a question for, for the body is, and, and for uh, uh, staff is whether a, a public hearing at the council level may be appropriate for this, uh, for this plan. Mr. Manley? I, I was, had another question, but I guess I would, just as a follow-up to, to Mr. Bear's uh, question, um, did the plan commission have a public hearing on this, or, or would the plan commission be required to have a, a public hearing um, on this project at any step along the way? Mr. Burns. Uh, the Plan Commission has reviewed this project. Uh, that was not a public hearing. It was an initial review of the site plan, and there was no action taken by the Plan Commission. They just provided feedback. Uh, this project would come back to the Plan Commission for action on a site plan. Uh, that also does not require a formal public hearing. Um, our agreement with Five Bugles did contemplate that there would be a couple of, of public forums, I believe they were called. Uh, what we had discussed uh, at, at that time and with the ad hoc committee was that it would likely be an, an open house forum uh, where you'd have scheduled for a time, have the architect available to make a presentation, and then kind of have it, it, it be open for interaction where people can come up, look at the plans, ask questions. And we had talked about uh, doing those uh, probably, one, as we were getting close to the end of the, the schematic design process, but we wanted to have this discussion. With, with the council prior to scheduling that and then you could do a second one um, after you have the detailed design and prior to construction and then uh, also have an open house once the project is complete thank you I, I, I just wanted to ask a question um, as well or at least make a comment if you're looking for feedback I guess um, <coughs> You know, this, it's a very big number in terms of the cost, um, but I think we're getting a lot uh, out of it. I mean, if we if we can get 50 years out of this facility, um, I mean, you wouldn't be able to build this 10 years from now for anywhere near this, let alone 50 years from now. Um, on, on the on the question of the additional bay, 
I, I don't think it's a question of if we'll need an additional bay. I think it's a question of when. And just on the back of the envelope math, I mean, the marginal cost of adding it right now is is about half of what we're paying per square foot for the rest of the building. Uh, and it's considerably less than what it would cost to add that capacity um, somewhere else at, at a satellite location. Um, I, I, th I think f from that standpoint, it makes an awful lot of sense um, to, you know, to, to build now rather than later. I was at one of the prior meetings of the of the ad hoc committee. I was in favor of adding additional storage because in in the basement because every every organization I've ever been in, involved in has always had a, a storage problem um, and having it's, it just seems like you can never have enough storage. But I am concerned about the point that. Mr. Steiner raised, and um, I think that a, a big part going forward of any decision to have storage has to be made with, you know, a very clear-eyed vision toward, you know, what kind of water intrusion might we have in underground storage. That's, um, but I think the, the again the question isn't do we need storage; it's how do we go about it. Um, so that's that's my perspective for you if you're looking for feedback from the council this evening. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I'm personally comfortable because I'm on the ad hoc committee, so I've heard a lot of this discussion, and I'm personally comfortable saying yes, go go for it. I trust the process, but I am uncomfortable with um, not having a public hearing at some point. So I'm wondering if one of those public forums could become a public hearing instead. So that it doesn't take more time, but maybe um, rather than having two public forums, have a forum and a hearing. Well, I would say as well, I, I appreciate the the chance to knock down by one, you know, meetings. I, it's nice to not to have another meeting, but the problem I would say with a forum versus the other option is that it, it's one so much more formal. I think people are sometimes intimidated to ask the tougher question in a which they can in a casual setting, you know. It's just it's easier, I think, sometimes in a in the, in that setting. Whether you know, it's just the architect asking an, answering questions as they come up informally, as opposed to the the other option, which Mr. And, and I'm not opposed to having uh, the the option Mr. Bear has presented. I think that's important. I, what I would say is that I I would prefer to wait two weeks. Not that I don't want to give them the to go ahead, but uh, the input that I've gotten is much to what you've all, or what Mr. Bear said, Mr. Manley said, it's a big number. It's a very big number. And uh, I think the more time people have to a ask questions of us, ask questions of staff, and for people to explain why it's important for us to invest this money in the fire department, I think the better off we are getting the city behind us. So uh, that's what I would prefer to see us do at this point. So, if if there is no motion, um, do, do you have do you feel like you have enough guidance to at least know that we're we're certainly oh sure no we're, we're certainly it. very happy with what you presented at, tonight. And I we're at your that. back and call so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, that being said, if there is no motion currently, um, I would recommend that we would have this on our next next agenda item for uh, again possible uh, action. And if you do have any other further questions, if you have any other further questions, or if people are out in the, the general public who are watching this, if you have questions, please feel free to call staff or any one of your aldermen um, and direct the questions to us because that's uh, why we're here. So hopefully we'll get some if they need it to be answered. Yes, Ms. Riki. So my question is, can that next council meeting or if there's a plan commission meeting before that, um, can those both have public hearings? I'll leave that to Mr. Burns. <coughs> there won't be another plan. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what I'd like to do at this point is, is maybe be able to have a conversation uh, with, with the architect about uh, when they feel that they could be ready for either that initial public forum and or uh, public hearing. And we try to get something scheduled um, either 
in conjunction with the next council meeting or if we can do something and, and get notice out prior to that. But um, if, if I could, I, I guess, get some options, have a discussion about that, we can get some suggested dates and then send that out to the council. I, I think that's a, a very good way to proceed with this and just simply because it's so much money more than the city has ever spent on any single item before that we need to have public input here. Um, so I appreciate that that offer and, and uh, the other point I think I have is, you know, we all know and those in this room know better than us the, the need for a new fire station and I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant, to, hesitant to say whether, you know, voters, taxpayers know that that need exists. So I'm curious if, if any part of the public forum could also include the, the dire need for a new space just to help us make this case. Mr. Manley. Thank you, Mr. President. I guess I'm a little bit conflicted or a little bit torn uh, on, the, on the process here because I, I always want to hear more from constituents and I always want to give the public um, an opportunity to weigh in. Um, but I also want to keep the project on track and I don't want to unnecessarily delay anything, especially if we have opportunities to save money based on construction schedule and seasons and so forth. Um, I guess where I'm going with this is if, if we would, you know, allow us to move from the schematic stage into the next stage this evening, we're not approving a budget, we're not spending money, we're not really doing anything other than moving into that next phase where we're actually probably going to get the more robust public input anyway. And so I'm maybe two weeks doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but I just am kind of wondering what we really gain by not doing anything tonight and waiting two weeks. Well, I will, I will say this. I, I don't get a lot of calls at home, but uh, a couple of the calls I've gotten recently have been specifically about this and the article that was in the paper. And, you know, as those, those of you know, I'm, I'm up for re-election, but I'm not having to campaign like some of you who are up for re-election. Um, so it's, it would be easy for me to just sit back and say that's, you know, let's just push this forward. But I, the comments that I've gotten, I've, I've had to have the discussion about why I think it's important and why we should make the investment. And I think, I think we just need to have, take that time to let other people weigh in on that with all of us. And I, I, I just don't know that that necessarily is, has happened yet. I've, I don't usually get calls and I've already gotten a few of them and a couple comments outside of phone calls. So that, that's why I'm pushing it. Now, maybe Steve, you could answer the question, what does it do anything to it? Does it unduly burden the potential for making this project come off? No, yeah, actually, I think uh, Bill can probably talk to the schedule more that we're talking about multiple bid packages. As far as my contract, uh, you certainly have the ability to pull the plug on on the project virtually any time. And, uh, you know, we'll have multiple checks and, and balances. So if you want us to, to move ahead and, and get two, two weeks more worth of work on it, the, uh, about the only stipulation is is that our, our first phase is completed. And so you'd have two weeks two weeks worth of work uh, that you'd be compensating us for, but it, it, in the grand scheme of our architectural contract, it's, it's not uh, meat and potatoes. We can work with you, certainly, however. Mr. Penor? As I mentioned before, you know, time is money from a standpoint if you can do anything in warmer months that is, is weather sensitive, um, mainly masonry, concrete work. So, you know, again, like the chief said, he doesn't have a crystal ball, neither do we from a weather standpoint. I've had years where we completed masonry without the expensive winter conditions costs, and then a week later, you know, winter slammed us. And if you would have been two weeks behind, you would have had expensive costs. So, you know, who knows? It, you know, to be on the aggressive side, we always like to start as early as possible. And, you know, you're just, you know, rolling the dice, have a lot better shot of avoiding winter construction, but, but you don't know. Okay, and you're better off the earlier you start. 
realistically, when would you be able to start if this body said go and the city was behind it? Well, right now, the schedule we're tracking from a design standpoint was ready to have a, a full construction set of documents uh, ready for essentially a early July start. As I mentioned before, if we did the multiple bid packages, and what that means is you're only bidding out work that needs to start right away while the design continues, you know, I, I'm thinking you could pick up at least a month doing that. Um, again, that's something we'd have to work out with Five Bugles on how we, you know, sequentially work out those bid packages. Um, so that, again, we can strategize on those type of things. Bottom line is, I guess to be honest about it, if you lose two weeks in design, you've lost two weeks in, in starting construction. You know, it, it does add up that way. For what it's worth, we're, Bill, you can probably address this more than I can, but I think we're, we're probably a month behind where, where we uh, started launching into it uh, early on. I, yeah, I, I think that that's correct. I think when, when we first laid out a tentative schedule back early fall, um, it had us about a month farther along at, at this point. I think the, the ad hoc committee took an extra couple of weeks, and then uh, we wanted to bring things um, back and come back to council at, at this meeting. Um, so there's probably two weeks recently that, that we've added on there. Uh, I think within that, we felt that we could still meet the, the July 1 target date, but I think there's less room to, to do that with pushing things back and you may look at starting construction later um, subject to the the multiple bid process that's being discussed tonight mr steiner mr president are you just looking for a motion to accept the schematic phase as said is that what you're looking for we certainly for? could have that too and, and would that be helpful if we, if we would get, get that into? Sure. I'll, I'll make that motion to accept the schema schematic phase that's been presented tonight uh, with the understanding that that would be helpful for the construction people to move forward on a timely basis. Thank you, Mr. Steiner. Second. Thank you, Ms. Rickey. Any further discussion? Ms. Rickey? I would just like to be assured that if this indeed goes through tonight, that if there were some major grievance that um, people were not in favor of, that that could be changed still? Oh, as I said earlier, our contract, uh, uh, you, you can basically close down the job at any time that you would like. There's some termination clauses in there, but uh, certainly we've never We've never uh, in, even remotely tried to enforce anything like that. So, thank you, Mr. Bear. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I think it. I'm a little disappointed to hear that a public forum was included in the contract and hasn't been done. If if I heard correctly, and I think that that was you know that's a mistake, and I think it would be a mistake to continue without getting that public forum and having a public hearing. And two weeks is only two weeks, and I I think that there are <coughs> certainly ways to to mitigate that and and you know two weeks to consider a 10 million dollar project is not not a big deal um so i i would vote no on this uh motion for that reason thank you if there's no further disc <laughs> very good i think i'm in your blind spot tonight I'm sorry <laughs> um I wouldn't want to discredit a public forum by any means, but I think the end result, no matter what, is we're, there's a need for a new fire station, and we're going to have to build a new fire station. And if approving the schematic design tonight means that we have two extra weeks where we might not have to incur additional costs for the city for winter construction, I would be willing to make that vote tonight, yes, and then not have those costs down the road. And there still will be plenty of opportunity for public input throughout this process. There are by no means that we're trying to not include the public in this process. It's just if we can save the public money, I think we should make that vote. Mr. Manley. I wanna echo those comments and just add that the, f the further along we get in this process and the more uh, details and meat on the bones that we have prior to having a public comment 
period or a public forum or a listening session or or even a public hearing the more informed input i think we can get from the citizens and um, I, I think that there are so many steps, iterative steps in this process going forward before we commit the city to this is what we're going to do and we are far from that point and, and uh, I think that there are ample opportunities for the public and for us as, as council members to affect the outcome of, of, the, of the final product here. I, I just would like to see the process move forward so that we don't lose additional time. I know that as an odd ad hoc committee member, um, we are not as far along as we hoped that we would be when we you know, set out looking at this project last year. So um, if there's an opportunity to make up some of that lost time, I think there's value in doing that. Mr. Yers. I think I, I also want to agree with um, Mrs. Doyle's, Ms. Doyle's um, comments. I, I, I don't want the public to be left out by any stretch of the imagination, and I don't think they will be. Um, we're not uh, making any final decisions tonight. Um, I think this is an opportunity to save money down the road, um, and I think, that's, I think that's a smart move to make. Um, and I want to encourage the public, <coughs> excuse me, I want to encourage the public to come uh, to these meetings as well. Um, there's public comment on every single one of our uh, council meeting agendas. And um, since my time on the council, I've, I've loved seeing an increased number of people coming to these meetings. Um, it's showing an interest in the city. And um, I, I look forward to hearing their comments. Very good. Mr. Diaz. Thank you. Um, I just want to agree with the, the previous speakers on the opportunity to save a little bit of money and to give people an opportunity later in the process when we have more details, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about the best way to reach out to people and to give people a chance to offer offer meaningful feedback. And I think it's not not merely just offering opportunities, because because I always like to hear from my constituents, and, and at any time someone could could email or call or whatever. But I also think we need to give people meaningful information um, before they solicit their feedback. And I think I think we're too early in the process, and I think that. It, it, it might be too generic and be like, well, do we need a new fire department? I think a lot of people would say yes, but without details, I, I just worry that we, we would give people hearing fatigue and then and then they'd end up surprised at the end of the process um, when they kind of tuned it out. So I think, I think we're better off offering people an opportunity a little bit later in the process when there'll be a chance for more meaningful input. Great. Um, when we vote tonight on the schematic, will it include seven or eight bays? Thank you. <laughs> I think that's one of the things he needs directions from right now. So then I, I would um, say put in eight. Um, I, I, I agree with Mr. Manley's um, suggestion that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And like I said before, when, when we built City Hall, I appreciated the fact that we built it too big. Um, you know, we don't want to build something and then a few years down the road say, oops. Um, so I, I, I'm comfortable with the eight. Ms. Reiki. I just want to point out that I, um, being on the ad hoc public safety committee and just um, feeling like I, I needed more input because I, I was kind of sure about where I stood on certain things but um, didn't know how other people outside of the committee felt. And so I did elicit um, responses from the people whose email addresses I have, which is like 240 people in my district and um, I got quite a good response and so now I do feel a lot more comfortable with, with the eight bays and the 65 parking stalls and the red color <laughs> and things like that because um, people, people responded directly to those, those questions that I asked and I gave as little information as I could so that the email wasn't too long that people would just ignore it. Um, and you know, and then um, got got a lot of feedback. So uh, that's that's sort of what's helping me feel comfortable with with going through with approving the schematic phase, and also knowing that alterations can be made still in the future, based on future public input. Did you 
did you feel like you had enough input as far as a consensus of moving forward on the eight bays then? Sure. Uh, am I hearing that correctly from the body? I know there was some question, at least that. And then as far as the vote goes, I'm going to call the vote, but it sounds like the vote's pretty much been made. So at this point, uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion as presented by Mr. Steiner signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Please let the record reflect. One nay. Mr. Bear, thank you. So very good. I appreciate that. I'd also like, uh, the camera doesn't typically look back. I, I'd like to make note that there were 30 uh, public safety people here tonight and uh, who were interested in this process. And I think it's important that the public knows that you all were here. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your support. Um, that being said, uh, I think w it took a little bit longer than I might have anticipated, okay. but that's it's good. It was good discussion. So thank you for coming, and we'll, we'll hear some more. Uh, we will move on to presentation of Civic Plus website development under item um, 991 or 92. Excuse me, 102. I've been corrected. Unfortunately, sir, uh, that means your time has been cut by <laughs> a significant amount. <laughs> and he's not listening, so he's, he doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Burns will make an in introduction here. Yeah, I just wanted to provide a little explanation. Uh, the, the city has had some discussion during the budget process about a redesign of the city website, and some funds were included in, in the BTRB budget. Uh, the Finance Committee discussed this topic two weeks ago um, in a recommendation from staff uh, to, to utilize Civic Plus for a website redesign. Um, at that point, uh, there, there was no formal action by the Finance Committee. We also had a resident speak at public comment at the council meeting and, and some discussion that that generated about uh, whether or not the city should be looking at an open source um, platform um, and working with a web developer rather than using a, a firm like Civic Plus. Uh, this item is on the council agenda for tonight for discussion purposes. We're not anticipating action this evening, uh, but we thought because this item did come up um, at, at public comment and, and discussion at the council, it made sense um, to have the discussion with the council, provide some more information. Uh, we have Brian from uh, Civic Plus uh, who offered uh, to come up here from uh, Kansas City, I believe, or? St. Louis, yes, thank you. Um, so, so came up a distance, and we wanted to uh, let everyone get a chance uh, to hear his presentation. Uh, we did notify the resident who spoke uh, during public comment. Unfortunately, she is out of town and was unable to be here this evening. Uh, I believe that she is planning to watch this meeting on YouTube, and then uh, staff are going to follow up with her and meet with her following this meeting and, and continue that discussion. Okay. With that. Great, guys. Thanks. Great to be here. Um, I'm Brian Haldeg, Civic Plus. Been on board with Civic Plus for about five years Talk now. Talk into the mic. Okay. Been on board for about five years now at Civic Plus, so I've worked with a lot of communities in the area, so um, it's great to be here in Verona, so uh, thank you for having us. Um, what we'll do today is we'll, I don't want to put you guys through a system training. Um, that's the last thing I want to do. Um, we'll, we'll cover at high level. Um, We'll probably, um, you know, start with PowerPoint um, here and then transition into live sites if, um, if we need to go live. So um, we'll get started. Design is very important here at Civic Plus. Um, as you can see on the, the screens, we do put a lot of resources into design itself. So um, 10 years experience with uh, design, specializing in government. Um, you'll see the sites are... Uh, very icon driven. We found in um, a study two years ago that uh, thousands of residents uh, were experiencing disconnect uh, between the websites and the services they offered um, versus what they thought the website could could offer to them in terms of um, functionality. So um, the icons look great. Um, they're very functional as well. So strong use of color, um, news, calendaring, spotlighting being done. Um, so uh, just um, some, some example designs here that we're looking at. So um, we'll look at more coming up um, and talk more about the process coming up now as well. All right, so in terms of our model at Civic Plus, we want to allow you guys to better engage with the public. Uh, the last thing we want to do is put a static website in place. So um, we'll look at some ways that we can do that today. Um, we call them modules, and they're interactive 
uh, pieces of the website that will push information out to the residents and allow them to also engage with you guys as well. So um, I'll mention it now, we do have an engagement promise. Um, it's pretty bold, we're excited to now offer it, we can even contract for it. And that would be that over the course of a year, we'll improve engagement by up to 50%. So um, we're willing to contract for that. So we can literally guarantee um, more engaged residents on the website itself. So very excited to now offer that. Um, just a little bit about us. We're based out of Manhattan, Kansas. So um, dead smack in the center of the country for the most part. Um, 1,600 clients on board, roughly. Um, actually approaching 1,700 now. 10 years plus um, experience at Civic Plus, over 150 staff on board. Um, so big shop for what we do, and we've been doing it for quite a while. Um, just some, some sample clients. Plano, Texas, um, a large client. Um, looked at us uh, versus SharePoint. Uh, selected Civic Plus due to our ease of use and functionality. We do have about 200 clients in Texas. Um, Loudoun County is Leesburg, Virginia, very progressive East Coast client. Um, the residents expected a top-notch solution, so they um, procured Civic Plus, and we're happy to support them as well. San Jose is the 10th largest city um, in the nation, also one of our largest clients on board right now in terms of cities. Um, and content was a major challenge in San Jose, just with being as large as they were. Um, Maui County, I think that speaks well for one design. It's been um, recognized as one of the best looking government websites um, in the world, as well as um, the distance and um, emergency support that we can provide for them. So um, we're happy to have them on board as well. If you guys want to go out there for a regional training, um, let us know and we'll make it happen. So I'm waiting for that as well. Um, Daytona Beach, um, just another example client, a lot of fluctuation in terms of um, the events they have going on down there. So um, we're talking fluctuation of residents between um, or going from 60,000 up to 200,000 um, with race week and, and everything like that. So we're happy to have them. And Pierce County is an, another great example of a client that had a lot of content. Um, they house City of Tacoma, so pretty large project that we worked on um, getting through that content process. So um, we want to help you guys with more than just a website, though. Um, want you to see the, the uh, total cost of ownership um, and return on investment that you put into this project. We want to help up with online transactions as well. Um, so Civic Plus will handle that um, and be able to help in those areas. Um, in terms of pushing information out, um, reducing print, um, the website will push out information in terms of email, SMS, uh, Facebook integration, Twitter integration. Um, the RSS feeds, um, we're thinking about, we're actually talking with Code Red and, and um, thinking about tying in with other emergency um, systems providers. So um, pushing information out in various different channels, not assuming the resident is always going to come to the website. And want to help out with engagement. This is probably one of our largest points here at Civic Plus is um, getting the residents engaged, as I mentioned, um, putting in place our promise to do that. Um, how are we going to do that? Online forms, um, the request management piece. Um, we offer a piece called Community Voice as well. It's a module. We'll look at that coming up to take in citizen feedback and crowdsource feedback. If you'd want to consider doing that, you could do that um, through the system as well. So um, just a lot more engagement. Residents can share if they were to leave feedback on a topic, um, you know, so that they can broadcast to their friends on Facebook that they're doing things and interacting with the city online. Now, the process, uh, we do include a project manager. They'll work with you from start to finish. Um, a lot of hand-holding, best practices, recommendations, um, you know, that they are making throughout the process. We've, again, worked with a lot of cities and counties. Um, it's, our, it's our core specialty at Civic Plus. So just a lot of best practices and recommendations that they'll make throughout the project. Um, design will be a custom design. Um, it will be a fully responsive design as well. If you guys elect to go that route, it's the same price either way to uh, put in place a fully um, responsive design that's going to adapt to any uh, device that, that you're viewing the website on. Um, and it's custom, so we'll work back and forth with you guys during design to um, literally obtain your sign off to move forward on design. So we wanna make sure that you guys are um, in love with this next design. Uh, we've got a lot of experience and we'll work with you um, until you guys uh, approve the design to move forward. Content migration. Um, we'll migrate it all. 
we're going to touch it all by hand. We're not going to put a script in place that um, brings it into the new site and just leaves it somewhere. So um, the very long pages will shorten up. Um, we're going to rewrite that content so it's um, best practices enabled. It's readable by the resident. They can skim it and scan it. Um, so we're going to touch all the content by hand. Um, and then in terms of training, we have proposed three days on-site training uh, for staff. The system is very intuitive. However, we do have over 40 modules that are included, so we want to make sure that staff are comfortable with them and how to operate them. Um, also, with the on-site training, we can provide a lot of um, soft consulting, best practices, recommendations, things like that. Um, so, and it's just much more interactive um, since we are on-site with you guys. Brian? Uh, before you go any further, mm -hmm. um, so you're saying you have three days of on-site? So Correct. So all the staff has three days of training? It's for up to 12 staff. Okay. or groups of up to 12. So if you guys wanted to do a group of calendar users and newsflash users versus another group that worked with the agenda center, you could segment out. It's a, it's a customized training, but it would be three days worth for groups of up to 12 at a time. So, and Bill, if you can have factored into how you would accommodate that, because that's, you know, that's a pretty significant chunk of our staff to be doing three days of training. Uh, yeah, we, we did discuss this at a staff meeting. We haven't gotten into the details of, of what specifically we would schedule for wh what times, but uh, we would have uh, the resource available on site. And then what I would anticipate doing is we would identify from each one of our departments who would be the primary uh, person responsible for updating website content at their department. Those people would go to, to at least the baseline training. And then for some of these additional modules, uh, we would identify who are the people that are going to be using them or that are going to be the primary contacts. And schedule them for those segments of the training. Uh, so I, I wouldn't anticipate that all of our staff would be at three solid days of training, but we could take advantage of, of those resources over that time period. Um, I, I did talk to, to some of the people in area communities that have, have used Civic Plus, including somebody that went through the transition, and, and he commented that, um, you know, I think he went through um, a couple three-hour blocks of training and felt that it, it was a good amount to do. It, it wasn't as time intensive as he thought it might be going into it. Thank you. Great. And the training would be customized, so we'll contact you guys in advance to plan that accordingly. Um, more benefits into the future, we do include account managers uh, as well as support. The account managers will help plan for new pieces of functionality that we roll out or you guys are looking to implement. Um, so if you wanted to put up a calendar category for a community um, cat category that could be, um, items could be submitted to and approved, um, they would work with you to do that. So um, a lot of uh, tips and uh, recommendations that they can make, uh, they're there to support your functionality needs. Um, and then in terms of support, it's 24-7, 365. Anyone can call us. It's um, any department, um, staff, as long as they have a username and password to the system can call. It doesn't have to run through one general uh, point of contact here. So um, support is based in-house. And then one of our biggest points here at Civic Plus is our ongoing upgrades and enhancements. Um, last year alone, we put in $2.5 million into the platform. So a lot of functionality that we're rolling out to our clients on a yearly basis. Um, it's not um, paid for separately. It's just included in the package. So as time goes on, um, we're continually adding to the system, and our clients are able to use um, any of the modules that we roll out. So, and again, those account managers are there to help you guys vet those out and determine if they make sense to use or not. So, um, a lot of upgrades and enhancements. Um, I have documentation we can look at after the or during the meeting uh, that shows what we've done. Um, ADA compliant. Uh, the site will be Section 508 and ADA compliant. We've had clients contract with us just to be compliant. Um, and then we do include Civic Plus University for online training, um, training videos, um, manuals. That's going to help with turnover over time, which is one of our strengths, is that not only do we include the support, but we have the online um, training facility to use, and not you won't have to always pay for training as time goes on. Um, so consider that. And then Civic Plus Connection is actually quite interesting. We uh, client source functionality um, in Civic Plus Connection. So. Last year, we, we built about 25 different things 
um, or made 25 different enhancements to the system on top of our normal uh, programming um, that we were doing throughout the year. And those were all client-driven requests. So clients are welcome to submit information there. And then um, we are building the functionality and rolling it out to the entire client base so everyone wins from, from those suggestions. And just a couple more points here. Um, hosting is included. It's a secure data center based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, the rollover is Omaha, Nebraska. Um, tertiary is Manhattan, Kansas. So uh, full redundancy, backups, disaster recovery, security, virus detection, intrusion detection. Um, we're monitoring uptime. Um, so um, everything is, is hosted here at Civic Plus and fully secure. And then we do include the redesign every four years. Um, there's a lot that can be done to the site um, without having to do the redesign, um, such as administrating uh, background images, the slideshow. If you have a really prominent slideshow on the home page, those images can be rotated out. Um, the navigation buttons, um, I think in the previous meeting um, I'd listened in, um, I do want to clarify that if you guys had to rename one of those drop downs, it's a text file, so you could retype over the button and do that. Um, so, and wouldn't have to pay to do that either. So it's very easily um, done. That was actually a client uh, request because over the years you'll want to rename the navigation to improve traffic and things like that. So um, very easily done. There's a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can change on the home page, um, the icons, the buttons, the navigation names, uh, background images, and slideshow. So um, virtually everything can be changed. So um, just some pieces of functionality I want to highlight. We'll start at the bottom and kind of work our way up, and then we can go live as well if you'd like and look at some live sites. But for time's sake, um, I just took some screenshots here before the meeting today. Um, but we found that clients do struggle with good calendaring. Um, so you'll see here on the screenshot um, different views, lists, uh, week, month view, able to search calendar um, for a certain topic, able to search by year. Um, also, you're able to select a calendar category. Um, you'll see here the different icons. You can actually opt in with iCal and add this to your Outlook calendar. So there's some really nice pieces of the calendar um, that the residents can use. Um, this is our Notify Me module, and this is going to push information out. Um, it, it's, a, it's actually tied into our other modules as well. So not only will it send newsletters and updates, but it'll send out alerts, bid postings, job postings. Um, it's going to be able to notify if, a, if an agenda or minutes um, are posted on the site. So um, not only will it send out information and updates via email and text message, um, but it'll actually tie into the other pieces of the system as well and help to automate that and reduce that silo uh, effect of using different solutions to send out the same piece of information. Um, the request tracker is a very heavily used module. Um, this is going to allow you guys to set up different online forms and be able to route those to the appropriate areas of the city. Um, full workflow, permissions, um, you're able to report based off certain items that have come in and see how many items are in queue. Um, time to close, items still open, staff performance. Um, so you're able to map the items, print work orders. There's just a lot of functionality that can be used. Um, so this is one of our, our main modules. It's been around for literally um, probably eight years, and we've, we still have clients that, that use it, even with all the other bolt-on pieces. Um, or solutions that can be added to the site. So um, our request tracker is a, a great module to be um, used for customer service and engagement. Online forms, um, all the forms possess logic so they can total themselves. They can also be uh, e-payment activated. So if you wanted to create any sort of form and tie a payment type to it, you could easily do that. Uh, we do accept credit card and e-check. Um, we do see our clients doing uh, payments through Civic Plus um, via the smaller payment types, parking tickets, uh, vehicle stickers, animal licenses, things like that, um, not so much the taxes. So um, think of it as a, an assisting tool for some of your payment types that are smaller that you've wanted to put online or explore doing so. Um, new modules, we'll talk about some of the newer, newer ones, the Agenda Center. Um, is a, this is the front end we're looking at. This is going to allow you guys to post agendas, minutes, um, do so in a very clean fashion. The back end of it actually allows you to create the agenda internally. Um, and it has uh, workflow and permissions and um, really some nice tools to automate the process on the back end of creating that agenda. So um, only the front end, front end of it here. 
but it is fully searchable and, and organized. Um, we do have a dashboard capability where the resident or viewer uh, can come in and set up a, a dashboard um, to view the site in a certain way. So that's going to help out with a lot of times developers and people that are monitoring certain areas of the website. Um, so the dashboard would be a, a newer, more progressive module that we've come out with. Here's Community Voice. This is a screenshot from Middleton, um, one of the closer clients. Um, and you'll see here it's topic driven. So you guys could actually post different topics online and have the resident um, or anyone come in and comment on those areas. Um, it'll actually um, rank the most engaged residents. You can broadcast certain initiatives um, and highlight them. You can also show what has been implemented. Um, the resident would have to log in to use this functionality and there are uh, different filters that block profanity. Um, actually, the client is able to come in and interact as well and residents can flag topics as maybe being negative, but we've found that this is a great module and it often will police itself. Um, so consider this for getting an additional channel of information that you might not normally receive. So that is community voice. And then I mentioned mobile strategy. Um, we would include a full responsive design. So um, based off scaling the website, it's going to scale down appropriately. Um, it's going to show up appropriately off any device that, that is hitting the website. Uh, so this would be the most modern um, mobile approach, and this would also be included in the project as well. Um, so we've looked at some front-end functionality. We're going to just kind of transition over to the back end. This is our um, government content management system. It is proprietary to Civic Plus. Um, it has been around for over 10 years. We have about 6,000 government users on it uh, right now. Um, so it's a very heavily used platform nationwide. Um, and it's a great model because We've built it, we can control it and add to it, but it's your guys' per the contract. So if you ever wanted to uh, sever the contract or relationship, this would actually be yours to pull in-house and run in-house. So um, consider that. Um, it's very intuitive, it's very robust at the same time. Um, you'll see it's dashboard driven for the most part. Um, ease of use is a big focus of ours here at Civic Plus. So um, you'll see it's just a, an initial view of it, very soft on the eye. Um, non-threatening for staff. Um, just looking at here, um, you can see some shortcutting capabilities. Uh, we do have full content approval and permissions. Um, we do have client messages, sending out newsletters and things like that, but if you miss it, it's able to be viewed here. Um, site activity, um, you kind of get the idea, it's set up like a website on top. Um, so this is initially where staff would log in and land and start navigating to, uh, to administrate content. We'll take a quick look at a screenshot of how that is done. We have two tools in place um, that allow for content administration. Um, it, it's a combination of live edit and drag and drop. So you'll see here on this screen, um, you can actually literally hover over certain pieces of the page and they will actually light up in front of you and tell you what you can administrate. So if I were to want to remove this, again, if I had the permission uh, to do so as a staff member, user, I could click on that X and it would actually take that off the page. Um, grabbing items, I can come over here on the left, literally pull one into the page, it'll relight up again and I can let it go. So very easy to administrate content. It's happening in front of you. Um, and again, it's drag and drop enabled, so you're not having to program uh, the template. Um, although you can get to the HTML to, to work with the coding on the template if you need to. Um, all able to be done, but again, ease of use, consistency is what we strive for at Civic Plus, so drag and drop enabled and live edit enabled. So it's literally happening in front of you even though you're not on the live version of the website. And then in terms of the modules, we offer a lot, we include a lot, it's an all-inclusive approach, so it's up to you on what you want to use and we'll help you determine that. Um, but using the modules, it's, it's point and click, it's just like creating pages, it's very easy um, to administrate these modules. Um, no coding involved. You would literally click on the topic. Um, you're seeing, you know, big green buttons, add events, things like that. We're on the calendar right now. Um, so we make these very intuitive as well. And being that we've built them all um, internally, they all kind of look and feel and act the same internally. So if staff are comfortable with one, a lot of times they're going to be comfortable with another because it has that, that same look and feel to it. So, um, again, without going through a full system training, um, wanted to talk a little bit about our model. Um, 
would like to open up for questions now. We can talk about the proposal itself. Um, nearby clients, we do have about uh, 55 clients in state. Um, so Wisconsin is one of our larger states. Um, a lot of clients here in the area. Um, and I have some sites pulled up as well. Uh, if you guys want to take it live, we can look at live sites. We can look at the content management portion. We can look at the response of design and action. Um, so I will open up for questions. Mr. Diaz. Thank you. I just had a couple quick questions. Um, do you guys offer a um, uptime guarantee? And if so, what is it? Mm -hmm. Contracted, it's 99.7. Yeah. Um, we actually test out at about 99.8. Um, the reason we're at 99.8 or 7 and not 99.9 .9 is just being that we do have a very aggressive rollout schedule. So as I mentioned, the 2.5 million in um, enhancements, we have to get those to you guys. So that's why it's 99.7. Gotcha. <clears throat> Another another question. You talked a little bit about the, the proprietary database and, and transferring data out of it. How hard is that to do? I mean, is it just like one database to another database, or is there more manual? Because, I mean, I think... Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, per the contract, we would give it to you guys, and we would work with you to get it to you. So um, we very much take a partnership approach at Civic Plus and, um, you know, from start to finish. So... Um, it's very time consuming on our end uh, to get it to you. It would probably come via thumb drive, CD-ROM, um, and then we would actually help you guys load that here to run. Um, so it would be us probably spending the day to get it to you and then helping you get it running. Gotcha. This is a question for uh, Mr. Burns. Um, what would the next step be? And, and I'm not... <clears throat> don't necessarily have a preference for, for open source versus one vendor or another, but I'm, I'm wondering, how do we have an open, open bid process on this? Yeah, I, I think we would, uh, as a next step, go back to the finance committee and talk about um, process that we want to use and what some of the options are that are, are before us. Uh, we did want to have the discussion here rather than at finance just because we had the discussion at the last council meeting and thought it'd be good information for background for everyone. Um, at, at this point, staff has been um, contacting other communities and researching um, a, a couple of different options. And I, I see a couple of major decision points for us. Uh, one would be, do we want to go with an open source approach versus a proprietary approach? And if we go with a proprietary approach, our, our current provider is GovOffice. Um, we've been in communication with, with them of what it would take to update our, our site with them using some of their options uh, versus going with something like Civic Plus. So I, I think at this point, we want to gather that information, report back to the Finance Committee, and then have the discussion there about how we make those decisions and do we want to do um, an RFP process or do we want to look at, at options and make a recommendation based on those options we've looked at? Are there any further questions for Brian during the presentation? Did you guys want me to address some of the strengths for Civic Plus compared to any other solutions, whether it be another vendor, or open source? I just created a quick punch list while I was sitting in the meeting. Um, if you want, I can. It's Run it's through a, your punch list. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I like punch lists because they're usually pretty quick. So. Okay. Um, so design is award winning. Uh, over 300 awards in terms of our designs over the past three years. Um, enhanced security. Um, I had um, Muskego in particular um, work with us um, from an open source platform for enhanced security. Um, the best practices that we can recommend along the way for the project, I think um, hopefully that really will resonate, just being that we have worked with over 1,600 governments. Um, the ongoing programming um, that we do, again, 2.5 million. Um, us being able to help with staff turnover with the account managers and the online resources, uh, Civic Plus University. Um, planned updates and broadcasted updates because we're coding our own system and we can convey what's going to happen to you guys and when. Um, you won't experience unsupported versions because, again, it's, we know um, our planning schedule and, and what we're doing. Um, the engagement guarantee of 50% increased engagement, I think that's very powerful or will refund the money of the project. Um, government-specific functionality, ease of use, 
Um, we're all inclusive and it's easy to plan for the cost because we are all inclusive. So there wouldn't be any hidden costs over time. And also just overall reduction of risk. We've been through it many times. We specialize only in, in government. Um, you know, we want you guys to put your best foot forward. So um, we would definitely want to be the one to work with you to do that. So um, just some points as, uh, you know, sitting in the meeting. So wanted to convey those for you. I do have one one question or actually two based on one 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 of the things that struck me from the last meeting and, and the individual that came forward a citizen who, who's invested in the project because of what she does for a living that it struck me or her was the notion that there's a four year you're locked into four years and a specific website mm -hmm. look for four years and and the fact that in, in this day and age, that seems like an awful long time. Now, you've addressed that you can change, you know, the banner and that, that type of stuff. I'm wondering how often do you see communities really revamping the way, they're, the way it looks? I mean, surely you must keep track of that as you're moving forward. That's a great question. Um, we, we surveyed our clients when we came out with the redesign option being included, and the magic mark was four years. So that was per asking our clients. Um, if three years would be more of interest for you guys, we could definitely discuss a three year. But one thing to consider is that, yes, um, you can change virtually everything on the homepage. The main layout is going to be in place, the wireframe. So if the calendar's down here and the slide shows up here and it's very <laughs> wide, that will stay in place. But literally everything around it can be renamed um, the icons can be rotated out and changed. Um, so you do have to consider that the resident, though, um, they're going to get used to the, the site being the way it is for a while, and they're probably going to like it. Um, to change it out every year or every two years, it's going to be a little bit drastic for them. They're gonna, going to have to re-navigate it um, and retrain themselves how to do so. So we found, we like to suggest, if you're wanting to make drastic changes, change the slideshow. Um, you know, put different images in there. Um, even the navigation will do enough planning and consulting with you that you probably won't have to change the naming of the navigation itself because we're putting that planning in up front. Um, the icons of the modules, you know, those can all be rotated out and changed as different initiatives come up. We have clients doing spotlighting on the home page um, where you can put different initiatives in there. So um, it's kind of the skeleton will stay in place uh, for that amount of time, but everything can be pretty much rotated and changed out. So we've found that four years is kind of the magic mark. If we want to talk about three, we could. Um, I've seen um, Andy in, in Bayside, he redesigned at three. So it's been done, um, but we would recommend four. Thank you. Mr. Diaz. Th this might be too specific for this meeting, but I really hope we don't have a slideshow on our website because that's one of the worst web design things you can do. <laughs> well, there's one no vote for a slideshow. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? Very good. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks, guys. Love to have you on board. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. All right. We will move on to item 10.3. Approval of operator's license, Ms. Goldfield. Tonight we have two operator licenses up for approval. One from Brenna Grodegu at Gray's Tide House and Joni Welchley Buell, hard names this evening, at Edelweiss. Thank you, Ms. Goldfield. I would entertain a motion. Move to approve the operator's license. Thank you, Mr. Baer. Second. Second by Mr. Yers. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the operator's licenses as presented signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that passes. Thank you. Uh, under announcements, Mr. Steiner. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, our senior commission meeting for February uh, will be canceled. Our director comes on board on the 24th of this month. So we will resume senior commission meetings the second Tuesday of March. The Verona Historical Society will be meeting on the 19th of this month to continue their presentations on area country schools 
we meet at the Senior Center at 3 p.m. on the 19th. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steiner. Mr. Yours. <clears throat> Mine's not really a, much of an announcement. This is a question. Um, I was just wondering if city staff could find a way to get the Five Bugles presentation and, and uh, slideshow up on the website so that the public could start looking at it and familiarizing themselves with the project. Anyone else? I'm no longer in my blind spot, <laughs> Ms. Doyle. Um, I would just like to announce that this Thursday, February 13th at 3 p.m., the Verona Senior Center will be hosting a veteran support group. All branches and all ages are welcome. And if you would like more information, please contact Becky at the Senior Center. That was Thursday at 3 p.m. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no further announcements, uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Manley. Second. Thank you, Mr. Yers. All those in favor and adjournment, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And we are adjourned. Thank you. Good meeting. <laughs>